I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences along the way and how clinical trials have been invented, reinvented for our profession. So when I first started in this field, um, and it wasn't that long ago, um, computers were operating in a standalone environment. Floppy disks were used to transfer, transfer data between computers, and it was about the only means of doing this. We originally used the five and a half inch floppies, and we called them mini floppies, and they held about 11 pages of a Microsoft Word document. We were starting to transfer data using the smaller three and a half inch disks, and we really liked them because they were less likely to get bent when they were put in the mail. The modem became commonplace. This was exciting. We could hook, have a site hook up a telephone, and we could dial in, and if everything aligned just right, we'd be able to move the data from a clinical site into a database that we held. We generally did this once a week. It took hours to complete the task, and it meant that someone had to be on our end manning the process. I'm seeing heads shake. <laughs> um, and so um, this, would, this would all go really well as long as somebody didn't try to do something funky at the site, like make a phone call. That would blow everything. We'd have to start over. And, um, but it was progress, even though our definition of progress meant that there were many nights where I was sitting watching bits flying over a, a computer well into the night. The company I was at in 2000 launched a, an inter, uh, a homegrown internet-based um, system, and it was revolutionary. The sites were still collecting data onto paper forms just in case the internet went down, which it did. And they were entering, but they were entering the data into a system that saved directly into a centralized database. And even better, the real-time edit started firing, so the sites were getting feedback immediately. We thought we had it all. The early systems um, basically had some data entry screens, some simple edit checks, and a few reports. But the um, demand for capabilities now is far greater and more complex, and the software has become, the more software, the more complex the software has become, the more sophistication we want. Current EDC must-haves include intuitive study database build, easy user and site management, secure automated password retrievals, robust reporting, source data verification, and risk-based monitoring. Of course, we need to do queries and manage SAEs. We need to have many sites active at the same time. Labs need to be able to integrate, enter, or upload data directly in the system, medical coding, um, images uploaded and stored, and we want the systems to be able to alert everybody um, that's involved in the study. We want um, email and text alerts sent out to investigators and sponsors. We want patient reported outcomes and diaries. They all need to be available in the system. The more powerful the software became, the more we want. There's a, something about data management and power. Um, the complexity of the protocols keeps growing. And I can't even imagine how many floppy disks it would take to put one of the genetic data sets that I work with. I don't think they made enough. We want our systems to be able to keep up with this complexity. We need advanced tools to maximize efficiency and minimize the manual steps. The systems need to be available around the clock and across the globe. And if we're in a location with a spotty internet connection, we want the systems to be able to capture that data, store it locally, and then upload it once we're in a good internet connection. We want the systems to keep us in the know. We want any of the information gathered to be shared in real time with all the appropriate various roles involved in the study. And we want the convenience at our fingertips and want access to be available on many devices. We want to collect data on desktops and laptops and iPads and iPhones and from subjects and straight from health records and even directly from people's bodies now. And by the way, it all needs to be secure. In 2003, at the BioIT conference, the ability to use a web-based system was debated. The result of that debate was that 
Clinical data can be safely stored in a web-based EDC system as long as the application is properly designed and SOPs are followed. I'd like to add to that now that the same basic principles while they exist, we need to add the regulations that are governing us. Systems need to be 21 CFR Part 11. That needs to be included in the security model. We need access and auditing to be done at a low level. Um, the um, protocols for transferring data, as they change, we need the systems to be able to handle that. And any data stored in a secure hosting center needs to have appropriate backup and redundancies, even if it's not, if it's stored someplace else. We need to offer more choices and we need to keep costs down. <clears throat> not too long ago, there was only a few commercially available EDC systems to choose from. And today the choices are many. What are the factors that need to be considered when you're choosing an EDC system? Uh, cost is a big one. Um, there are many different pricing models out there. And you might want to consider a licensing or a subscription, a pay-as-you-go or a pay-per-protocol. Those are all familiar models, and each one has merits. And depending on what you're looking for, you might be able to find the cost to relate to that. Um, when you're looking at features, the question you need to ask is, can the EDC system deliver what is needed for the protocol? Does it deliver too much? And the answers to those questions can help if you're looking, can help you determine if you're looking for the right software. If the system that you're looking at doesn't deliver what you need, there's a system out there that will. You need to make sure that technical support is fully supported in the manner in which you need it. And we need to make sure that the system is going to be around for as long as we need it. Anybody that's been through a transformation from one system to another knows that if you can avoid doing that, you'll be a lot happier. So while EDC systems started um, growing in um, their complexity, there was something else that was happening with software, I guess, on the whole. But the interfaces to develop the system started becoming less programmer-oriented and more graphical user-friendly. So what does that all mean to us? So we always have had regulations in our um, practice, and we've got the um, drive, the markets driving the software. We always need to watch our budget. Um, so we kind of need to look at some creativity. What can that, uh, what, what kind of creativity can we find? So I found that there were um, data managers that liked to um, do development on their, you know, they were more technical. And by moving some of the development to the data management team, I found out that uh, when the CDM is controlling their own timeline, um, by not depending on outside resources, even if the outside resources are within the same organization, that there was a better control on the timeline. Um, data manager, Developing an EDC system or, or programming an EDC system could keep things close during the study startup. And that helped also keep control and saved some um, cost. The CDM salaries generally less than a database developers, and we also realized some more cost savings there. And I found that um, CDMs generally um, understood the issues, they knew the protocols. Um, they understood all the issues in reporting and in creating systems, and so there was a potential for a much better design. And I thought that um, adding a technical aspect to the CDM job was um, going to be an enrichment for um, data managers. And I thought that because I've always been a geek at heart. So here we were in a whole new fast-paced world where numbers of data managers have hopped onto the EDC development bandwagon. And then I walked down the hall, 
and I see my most experienced, competent data manager sobbing in her lunch bag. Because technology is moving at a fast pace, making it easier for some, and some people just got it. Not all data managers um, did or wanted to be in that arena. And so it was my job to make sure that there was um, two tracks, sort of a technical track within data management where people who understood that um, side of things could get into it, but the data managers that were really good, strong data managers could stay in that, stay doing what they did best. So shifting responsibilities within data management, there's a couple of things that we needed to make sure or everybody needs to make sure of. We need to make sure that there's adequate training for anybody that's shifting in responsibilities. And we also need to look at SOPs that could have um, any role-based um, tasks embedded in them and um, update those SOPs. So, 20 years ago, it was somewhat exotic to be on a call with California. My entire team was located within three floors of me. It was really easy to work um, closely with people. It was easy to see where um, things were um, weak, and it was easy to, to sort of rush in and do additional training and mentoring. It was cost effective to have the varying levels of people and tasks associated with those levels um, happen because everybody was in the same place at the same time. Today, we have globally um, staffed teams. I, my current team is in um, the US and Switzerland and in India. Um, and it's commonplace for me and probably lots of you to start your day or end your day with a call to another continent. There's a lot of literature out there about cult cultural differences which certainly spill into offices. And I've learned that cultural differences are not specific to continent or race or religion. I'm actually located in Waltham, Mass, and we have an office in Cambridge which is a mere nine miles away from us. And the cultural differences between our offices is great. Um, so I'd like to share a little bit um, some observations and some unexpected conclusions that I've drawn from our new global model. Time can be a pain to deal with. Everyone needs to navigate time zones, and I thought I was on top of it. And then daylight savings time happened. <laughs> All of my early morning meetings scheduled with India was suddenly not quite right. Things were showing up strange in people's calendars. And then I found out that Switzerland does do daylight savings time, but they're just not on the same schedule as us. So my advice is to understand time and how the differences affect everybody. And everybody needs to, to give a little when dealing with a, a global team. I love a good holiday as much as the next guy, but holidays across the continents can change timelines like you wouldn't believe. Again, you need to set the tone where everybody working on the team keeps, other, keeps each other abreast of time off, be it holiday, vacation, or PTO. The speed of times and pressures of dealing with an international team push us to use te technology to interact. An email is a great tool. We all seem to love and hate. And emotion portrayed in an email is interpreted differently across different readers. So I would say that you need to make sure that you're checking in with your team members by phone and have others do the same. People that work side by side see pictures hanging in cubes and they talk to each other while they're making coffee and when you don't have a face-to-face -face team, you may not have the same kind of good interactions. And these interactions um, cause a certain trust in dealing with others. So what I would say is that each team needs to find a way to make time to learn about each other, um, to converse on topics other than deliverables. I do weekly short check-ins with all of my team, do them individually, and I always ask about weekends or family um, weather. And in turn, they do the same. And what that's promoted is that we have, um, 
we, we have real conversations. We don't just talk about a deliverable and get off and, and, and we know each other. And I would suggest that that's a very important um, aspect. And then finally, um, I think that uh, everybody needs to be able to express the, their opinions. Um, the team won't be as strong as it can be if there are people who don't. And sometimes people don't for either cultural or hierarchical or comfort reasons. And I would challenge you to um, keep an eye out for silent affirmations of everything. So think about it. Have you ever been on a call where someone asks a question and even the crickets don't answer? So I would say you can learn to force disagreement if there's silence from stakeholders. You make a rule that everyone is required to state a position on something and that the whole team agrees that everybody's position is, is a valid position. You might have to come to an agreement about what position you want to take, but everybody's experiences and opinions are shared and you need to make it safe to do so. The challenges of managing and being a member of a global team or complex, the lack of face-to-face -face interaction can be overcome with the right effort, but it does take effort. The benefits can include a positive impact on your budget, greater abilities in your experience, the ability to hire the best regardless of location, and the ability to offer closer contact with all of your customers. used to be that CDMs wore a hat, we talked about that, but now they wear many hats and they don't spend their days just reviewing data. As things have become more complicated, data managers need to be able to coordinate with other data managers, clinical study managers and monitors. Some CDMs function as both project managers and data managers. Most need QA skills, the ability to perform vendor oversight of some sort, and of course be literate in the current data standards. The challenges that happen when people are performing in different roles, different levels, on budget, on time, producing quality work, operating in a streamlined manner, well, that can bring about stress and unrest. A team manager needs to be aware of this and assist with these challenges. Here are some questions that you can ask. Does a member need help accomplishing a task? Is that member adequately trained? Are there too many deliverables on a plate? Did you take the timeline and you looked at protocol A, knowing that it would be in the field before protocol B was going to be started, then protocol A got held up and now you've got somebody working on two protocols and pushing to get everything out the door. It's better to intervene and offer the right kind of help than it is to risk burnout. There's a lot of benefits to wearing a lot of hats, and that includes personal and job growth. Supervisors need to be aware of the opportunities that can enhance someone's career and help supporting people with their growth and their own goals. Not too long ago, people used to go to work for a company, and they expected to work there for a long time. And they, they were loyal to their company, and the company was loyal right back at them. Having the same people working together over a long period of time pr could provide stability, great coverage, and great institutional knowledge. That loyalty that existed when my parents were working no longer exists. According to a study that was published in February of 2015, 2,100 adults were surveyed, and 45% of them were ready to leave their current position for new employment, even if they were happy in their current position. That's pretty striking. I can't imagine how I would adequately plan for almost half of my staff leaving. So what do I do? I always have a good network um, out there. I'm always requesting a steady stream of current resumes, just to be sure. I. Um, have one strategy that I've implemented team-wide, and I think it, it would try and discourage the outflow of good talent, and that I make sure that one team or one location doesn't get all of the good work um, or the same type of work. I try to push out 
um, the teams and locations to be evenly balanced. And uh, one thing that we would do is we would have work performed in one, with one team or one location, and then have the QC done with another team or another location. And the next time, switch those, um, switch those roles. And that really kind of um, gives everybody the same sense of importance. Um, not only that, but having teams and members be able to do this covers um, cover tasks better um, and lessens the exposure and hopefully will make teams stronger and then will make people want to stay. I'm going to talk about um, sort of the two main processes that I feel like govern data management. SOPs and um, data management plans. So in this um, guideline, there are three sections that are uh, important. Uh, there's probably a lot of sections important, but important to what I'm talking about today. 5.1.1 talks about the sponsor being responsible for implementing and maintaining quality assurance and quality control systems um, with written SOPs to ensure that trials are conducted and data are generated, documented, et cetera. 5.1.3 says that quality control should be applied to each, state of each stage of data handling to ensure that all data are reliable and have been processed properly. And 5.2.1 talks about a sponsor being able to transfer any of their uh, trial-related duties to a CRO Ultimately, the responsibility lies with the sponsor, but that the CRO should also implement QA and QC um, processes. So I'd like to give you my take on creating standard operating procedures for clinical data management. So while their SOPs are a, a, key, a key component in the QA system, um, the act of creating or revising them is time consuming and sometimes met with a lot of groaning. That said, the goal is to create SOPs that accurately reflect regulations and guidelines and promote efficiency and not hinder project timelines. When technology is changing and when things are changing, it's a challenge to keep SOPs current and I would say that a QA team that's not necessarily familiar with the day-to-day -day DM functions shouldn't be solely responsible for creating the SOPs. I think to create a data management SOP, you need a plan. Um, you need to plan how you're going to do it. If you're starting from scratch, there's a couple of good resources. The SCDM um, publishes suggested SOPs in their good clinical data management practices. And Suzanne Proxa's book, The Practical Guide to Clinical Data Management, is another good place to go and look for guidance. Um, the plan that you create um, should include exactly how you're going to determine what SOPs to create, who will be involved, and what timeline they'll be completed in. And when you have an overall plan in place, then you need to create the list of key data management functions. Now, you would think that would be easy. And you would think that activities don't differ too much between companies. But an interesting way to go about it is to look at um, the data management billing codes on your timesheets, if you have them, or look at the, propo the proposal um, bid grids that your company has to see what are the lists that are, um, what are the tasks that are listed in those um, groups. Start with that, and then talk to the data managers. Does that match what the reality of what they're doing is? And, and get to a succinct list of what the data management functions are. Once you have a function, I say that you should develop some kind of a process flow where you take each function, so for this one, it's to create draft unique CRFs, and list out what are all the inputs that are needed um, to that output, and are there any forms um, that are related to it? So in this case, there's going to be a feedback form and then an authorization form, and finally to list who is responsible for reviewing and signing off 
of um, this function. And again, I think if you give this task to some different people, you'll come up with some different uh, process flows, but it's very interesting um, exercise to go through. When you feel like you're at the, um, that you've got the process flow defined well, I would say the next step would be to talk to the people that are in your review and sign off and make sure that they uh, agree that they are responsible for um, this task. Um, once the process flow is, is sort of set, I think then it's time to start writing what, uh, how do you get to that flow. At the, at the process flow, we didn't, we, it wasn't very specific, um, but now you want to start laying out to create a draft. You list the measures to be collected or you go to the library and, and look for a matching um, case report form. And I, all of this is morphing into an SOP. And if you've been including all of the people that are involved all along the way, you should have some really tight um, documents at the end of this. Um, while you're creating the SOPs, you need to be asking the questions, how are we going to know that this is being followed? And if you think back to the process flow for creating these, there were two documents. There was the feedback, and then there was the sign-off. And so we would be able to always say we knew that this was done right because we have these documents in place. So your SOPs are created and you're going to kick back and relax. But then comes the training. Have you ever started a new job and you spend the first few days, weeks, months reading SOPs and getting bleary eyed? Have you experienced SOP trainings which are read and understand the SOPs given to staff? They read and send back a form that they've signed off. I'd like to challenge that when you're releasing SOPs, you need to have a training planned. It's fine to send them out as read and understand, and I would give people a time, two weeks, read them and understand them, but you need to answer, you need to have a list of questions back. And then I would say you need to hold training meetings where the SOP is trained on, where you'd give actual examples, where you've created quizzes or games or something to know that the staff actually knows how to use the SOPs in their everyday work. And then periodically review the SOPs with your staff. Um, and finding out, find the time always to make sure that they're being followed, doing it in real time, not just when an audit is about to happen. And I would say that you need to um, set the tone from the leads down and set it as a do as I do tone. Um, and, um, and that actually includes having a sequence in your SOPs where, you've, uh, where you obtain signatures, where you make it, you put up barriers to proceeding to the next step unless all of the signatures are in place. Sometimes we're in a position where we're waiting on somebody else and they want us to just keep going, but SOPs that are, that are logically um, placed or logically stepped really need the sign off um, on the processes leading up to the next one. Let's see. So if SOPs, which are thought of as documents that don't change too often, um, but everything around us is changing, what do we do? We create guidelines and user manuals. Um, so at a level of um, the SOPs, and this I'm actually borrowing from uh, Prashka's book, it would say that all the data from case report forms are double entered, um, uh, period. That would be um, that. The guideline would say, the data will be double entered using a third party arbitration feature of the computer system. The first and second passes are performed by two independent operators. And the user manual would say, to begin the third party arbitration um, after the data has been entered twice, open in the enter menu and select arbitration from the drop down list. So while the SOP is going to reflect 
the corporate philosophy, there might be multi multiple user manuals and guidelines that would reflect individual um, EDC system um, specifics. A data management plan. So we already know that we've always been particular about what we do and how it's done. And so we create a plan to outline all of the work to be done, how it will be done, when it will be done, and what the outputs will be. Um, data management plans came into the SCDM's uh, GCDMP in 2008, when the GCDMP was first published in 2000. And DMPs aren't regulated documents, but they've become so common um, that they've become auditable documents. They are living documents, and as such, they're going to change over the course of the study. Um, for example, um, you know, we were just talking about data transfer agreements. In a data management plan, you might talk about the lab that's doing a particular um, service, and you would have uh, the reference to the data transfer agreement in there. And then at some point during the course of the study, that lab is no longer doing that. Your data management plan would need to be updated with the new information, and a new data transfer agreement would be executed. And you have to remember that as a living document, the data management plan is really a plan. And a plan is what's going to happen from here on. So your plan up to a certain point can change, and then you'll be all set moving, moving ahead. Um, when you're creating a new plan, you need to be able to, uh, you need to, be able to um, reference all the appl applicable regulations and guidelines and ensure that the tasks in the plan are relevant um, to the protocol. Um, and in creating a plan, you need to be sure that uh, somebody's examined the tasks and determined whether there's a more efficient manner of doing it. Um, DMPs um, can, to a large part, can be standardized, although I would caution that while having a great template is a good thing, um, I have seen DMPs in my past that were copied from one protocol to the other, and they actually have been signed off and, and they reference items from a different protocol. So you need to be really careful and you need to make sure that your review process is done and done well. And I think there's, at that point, um, and it's kind of challenging, but you need to create um, and you need to educate all of the stakeholders involved and um, not just have sort of a blind sign-off. Um, the review process is a great place to um, educate DMP naive um, stakeholders. So last fall, I attended um, a presentation at uh, the SCDM conference. It was called The Demise of Data Management. Um, and it was interesting. People shared their reasons for being in data management and how earlier experiences had shaped the current processes. And in the end, um, the thoughts that were left with the group included some of what I shared today. Um, that complexity in protocols put pressure on data management, expanding technology puts pressure on data management, and, and changes the way we look and think about data. We don't now often find the need to put a stamp on much anymore, but it doesn't mean that we can be any less rigorous in the control that we apply um, to our projects. <laughs>